Good morning. Blessings to you, and thank you for coming to this uh, 30th graduation exercise. We uh, recalculated it last night in my dreams that uh, our first graduation was 1991. So that makes this the 30th graduating class from Washtenaw Hills Academy. And uh, that's, a, that's a real milestone. We don't know, but what, maybe it'll be the last. You know, before Jesus comes, there's going to be a lot of lasts, don't you think? But nonetheless, we want to be ready and doing his will uh, as long as we can and preparing an army of young people to uh, carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. And uh, we're so glad that each of you can be here to share this happy occasion with us, even though we're a little bit strained because we have to follow some state guidelines. The um, governor has uh, allowed us to, to meet under certain circumstances, and we're trying to comply. And we ask uh, you for several things. First of all, that uh, this is a sacred ceremony here at Washtenaw Hills. Academy, and we ask that you refrain from applause and uh, any other um, expressions of exuberance uh, until at least until after all of the students have received their diplomas, and then we'll have one large uh, recognition for them. <clears throat> also, the um, afterwards we'll have a receiving line outside the building, and we're asking for the uh, usual antisocial distancing of six feet. And uh, we also need you to take your cell phones right now and uh, check them and see if they are on airplane mode. They need to be on airplane mode if we're going to be able to stream. And there's a lot of people that are, want to, are watching us and they will be able to see this service if we have our cell phones on uh, airplane mode. So thank you so much for that. Again, welcome to everyone, our families that have come some thousands of miles to, to be here and recognize their children's accomplishments. We also want to welcome all those who are joining us by uh, the streaming and uh, the recording this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, for health and life. We thank you for these graduates, and we thank you for what you've done in their lives, for what they have accomplished. Each one has spent numerous hours studying, uh, training, uh, vocational training, and they've had discouragements, trials, but you've been with them and brought them to this place in their education. Father, I ask that you will bless this service today and help us to receive the words that you have for us, take it to heart, and help us to go from this place with a determination to serve you, to work for you, and we give ourselves to you and we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
class of 2020, I was watching the jungle when I saw a troop of monkeys that were quite clever. They had found a way to get into the tallest tree in the jungle, the one that grew in the valley. And you might think that would be no challenge, but it was a challenge because the tree was too big around to shimmy up. Uh, monkeys aren't like squirrels. They don't have claws to climb. Uh, they climb the same way you would if you were more flexible. And so it took creativity, but they figured it out. They found a steep bank near the tree and trees growing on that bank that had overhanging branches and they could jump from one of those branches into that tallest tree. It was just a bonanza for them because there was so much food in the tree. For you, no food in the tree. These monkeys eat leaves. But in that particular tree, lots of food, just brand new shoots. They were so happy. And as I watched them, I mean, I don't say they were laughing. I imagine they were happy. But uh, as I watched them, one of them realized that just below him, about three or four meters, was a branch that no one was harvesting, a branch full of new soft buds, just the best. And so, gingerly, you know, dropping 10 feet is just nothing for a monkey. And uh, three meters, I don't know what I, if I said three feet, I surely was wrong. But anyway, he dropped down there to that branch and began to eat. And I saw, long before he saw, that as a monkey, he was in trouble. Here's what I saw. That was the lowest branch on the tree. And there were no branches within jumping distance above it and nothing below but granite boulders to jump to. And it was a long ways down. But while I saw that, the monkey didn't see it and he just enjoyed himself for 15, 20 minutes, just enjoyed himself. And then when he was full and ready to go back to wherever he was going, that's when he figured out he was in trouble. He looked here, he looked there, he went to the, it, to the trunk of the tree, he looked up, he looked around, there was just nothing he could do. And uh, he didn't waste a lot of time just fidgeting and feeling sorry for himself. He tried the only thing he could. He put his arms as much as he could around the tree and tried to start shimmying down the tree like this, but he didn't make it. He only went just a little ways before he fell to the rocks below. The monkey had poor foresight. And if I could challenge you with anything this morning, I'm gonna challenge you with more than one thing, but this is the first one. It's to please engage foresight. Begin to think, what will you be thinking a thousand years from now? When you're in heaven, what will you wish you had done with your brief life? What's gonna be important to you then? Think that way. Proverbs 22, 3 says that the wise man foresees the evil and he hides himself, but the uneducated passes on and is punished. Well, you're graduating, so that would tell me that you ought not to be uneducated. You shouldn't be the ones that are passing on. You ought to be the ones who are looking forward, and that's the first thought out of about four of them. I titled this short talk, Dishonorably Low Standards, because I really like your aim to elevate the standard. I like it. And uh, I want to tell you another story, and then we'll, I'll look at a Bible verse, because I think you won't, because I think you don't have Bibles with you. But this is the story of Abdullah. Abdullah, just three years ago, had no idea that he would ever be anything other than a Muslim. No idea at all. But when his friend Musab, who I mentioned yesterday, invited him to join him at a meeting with myself, he came, and by that time already, Abdullah was leaning towards skepticism. Maybe you know people who, after they left here, or after they left somewhere else, or cousins that are leaning towards skepticism. That's where Abdullah was leaning. He was beginning to wonder if God really exists. 
Is there really any such thing as God? Is religion just a joke? That's where Abdullah was. And he had never seen what you've seen. And when he saw Daniel 2, it really encouraged him. It really inspired him. And when he got his first Bible, he was so excited. I mean, his first, it's probably the only one he's ever had even now. But when he got it, he was so excited. But that same night that Heidi and I gave him a Bible, he asked us a very interesting question for a man who's just becoming a Christian. I want to stand where I can see you too. For a man who's just becoming a Christian, he said, is it all right for a Christian to marry a Muslim? Well, what do you think? What's the answer to that? Can you just give me a, a, an answer? Would that be yes or no? I hear three no's and see some head shaking. The answer is no, but how do you tell that to a man who isn't even baptized yet? He's just beginning. But what he let me know is that he was engaged to his childhood girlfriend. And now he's already about to graduate from university. It's the right time for him. It's, it's not a bad time. And, he's, and now, after they've been making plans for years, it, you know, the two of them are growing together, and now he's changing a bit. Do you see this? This is just really hard on her. Don't you feel bad for her already? At least a little. Maybe, maybe you're happy for her that her, that her boyfriend's going the right way, or fiancé. But the truth is, for Abdullah, it was so... 1 Corinthians 6, you know that passage, I think. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That passage, which to you right now seems just like good common sense, for him was difficult testing truth for a very baby person in religion. And I'll just make the story short and say that uh, he married her. And his interest in Bible study and in going forward went down for about eight months. But it's come back up recently. He's even helping someone else who's becoming a Christian now. And his wife hasn't taken an interest yet, but maybe she will in the future. You know, he made a mistake as he was a baby, but maybe it's going to be a save for him. But for you, it would be dishonorably low, wouldn't it? Uh, let me say it again quite simply, and I'll move on to my third point. What I see is the devil doesn't need a bunch of really complex, brand new, strange, weird tricks. He just has a very old, rusty bag of them, tools that seem to work remarkably well. And one of them is, uh, gentlemen, the eight of you, there's seven of you here and one somewhere else. Is that right? Uh, the eight of you, he has a beautiful, spiritually minded, intelligent young lady just waiting to sweep you off your feet that isn't, doesn't happen to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know it because I haven't talked to him about it. But I just know by experience that it seems like that he's able to get that orchestrated quite successfully. And ladies, he has for you a really handsome, hardworking man who's calm and sweet and has lots of time for you, who doesn't happen to be a Seventh-day Adventist. He has one somewhere, and I'm just saying, if you want to elevate the standard, be sure that that wrench doesn't work in your life. That's my first challenge, or second challenge, maybe. The first one is to have foresight. Uh, the third one comes from 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. And I'm just going to tell you what it says there. It's, the idea is that in every house, and this would be your homes, we have some vessels that are for honor and some vessels that are for dishonor. That is, some of them are salad bowls, and some of them are bowls for the toilet brush. And we need both those kind of bowls in the house, right? 
They're both sensible, useful, utilitarian parts of our home, but never ever would we confuse them. And if you don't have any clean dishes for your cereal, you won't go use that one from the bathroom, right? Because one is for honor and one is for dishonor. That's a metaphor in the Bible for the work of the Christian ministry and the work of government and police force, uh, civil force on this planet. Do you know God uses policemen? That God uses the military? He uses them to repress evil and to get good things done and to move the world and keep it from chaos. And I tell you, when the when the government was shut out of a little piece of Seattle, it didn't go well there. I think the whole world knows about that now, right? Maybe, maybe you don't know because you've been busy getting ready for graduation. But we need the military. We need police. They're great. But in the Bible, their work is compared to that toilet bowl, that toilet bowl brush. I mean, not the brush, but the container for the brush, but the brush too. It's compared to that. It's, it, you need it. It's necessary. God uses it to clean up messes, but it's not the work for you. That is, he has called his church to a high work, just as dangerous as military and police work, just as dangerous if it's done well and courageously, He's called us to a high work that is noble. In the Bible, you had King David who tried to do both. And you know, that's why God didn't let him build the temple. The reason he was not permitted to build the temple is because he had done that military work. He had, he had done that, if you will, police work of repressing evil. He had shed much blood, is what the prophet said to him. What I'm saying to you is not only do I hope you'll use foresight, not only do I hope that you'll avoid that rusty wrench of a, an unbelieving partner, but I am hoping that you will avoid the military and the police force and any of those equivalents that would put you where you are obligated or may be obligated to do the dirty work of shedding blood. We're talking about dishonorably low standards and those are dishonorably low standards for you. Not low standards for everyone, but low standards for you. My third point is from Romans 2.23 for those who, are, who have Bibles with them. It, what it says there is that you who make your boast in God in the law, excuse me, you who make your boast in the law through breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Uh, while I could maybe preach for an hour, worry not. I will just tell you two ways that people break the law dishonorably that Satan will certainly try to push you in that direction. One of them is by working on Sabbath. I know from talking to you that uh, at least some of you are considering the possibility of working in the medical field. Yes, people need to be cared for on Sabbath. But watch yourself that you don't use your job as an excuse to ignore the fourth commandment. Watch yourself. It's a big trick used often today to say if you have an important e an essential job, keeping the day holy, isn't something you have to do. And you really need to think it through because we dishonor God when we break his commandment. Well, I was going to say more about that, but I'm going to say less and tell you another story. It happened here. It happened in the cafeteria that I can't see unless we just put a hole through the wall right there. There's no way to see it, but I know it's that direction. I was in that cafeteria one day when a mother and father and a young man about your age walked in. His name is Karan. It was and it still is Karan. And uh, they were strangers to me, so I got up to go greet them. You know, I was a staff and I was thinking that we ought to make the strangers feel welcome. They had brought him to check out 
Well, that's the wrong word. They had brought him to enroll in Washita Hills College. They had brought him to register and to start school in the college program. As I introduced myself to them, Karan's father said to me in a rather gruff way, he said, you need to take my son's phone from him. He has a problem with worldly music and movies. I don't know you really that well. I don't know if you have troubles with worldly music and movies. I kind of doubt it, but I don't know. But Karan's dad, I'll just tell you frankly, should never have told me that in front of his son. That's a way to wound a man. That's a way to shame a boy. And for that young man to be shamed in front of this stranger by his own dad on the very first meeting was a very difficult thing for Quran. Can you picture how hard that would be for him? I felt such pity for the boy. And I said to the father, we're not going to take his phone from him. We don't have a rule here against college students having phones. I don't know if you do now, but that's how it was then. I suppose it's the same. We don't have a rule like that. If you and him want to deal with that, that's between you, but we're not getting involved in that. And I rather said it like I was irritated by the request, because I was. The father and I didn't get along too well, and then he left. And that same week, I suppose it was the next day, I took Quran on a walk. You know, have you been up to the ridge? I suppose you've been there like a few times. It was that direction, but we didn't get that far. And uh, I took him on a walk, and what I said to Quran, I said, the college here has very strict rules. In view of your aim, I would say high standards, but I was talking to Quran, and he wasn't one of you, so I said strict rules. I said, we have very strict rules. You know, they don't allow movies here, and they don't allow dating here, and I started going through some of them. I said, those are the kind of rules that if you don't want to be here are going to be galling. They're just going to drag on you. They're like a chain on your neck. You're going to, every day you're going to feel bad that you can't eat your junk food, you can't watch your movies, you can't play your video games. If you don't want to be here, it's like being in prison. It's just terrible. And I said to him, but the other students that are here, they came on purpose. And you might wonder why they would come voluntarily into such a difficult place. It's because, Quran, that they wanted what's being offered here, some spiritual growth. They wanted to grow in their experience with Jesus. And because that's what they're aiming for, all those rules are small things to them. They might like to date or watch movies or eat junk food whenever, that they, maybe they would, but in view of their goal, they can choose to put that away to accomplish what they will. Many people put away things they like to accomplish what they want. It's just part of life. Everyone does that, secular or spiritual. We put away things we want to accomplish things we want more. And I told Quran, what I hope you'll do is stay here for one week and watch for yourself and find out what the rules are and find out what the atmosphere is. And at the end of the week, I'd like you to choose for yourself Today or yesterday, your parents chose for you to be here, but I want you at the end of the week to choose if you want to be here. And if you decide at the end of the week that it's worthwhile to you, then I think these rules won't cause you any trouble at all. They'll be small things. But if you decide you don't want to be here, then I think it's going to be a galling chain on you that you shouldn't have to carry, and I will find a place for you to go. You don't have to go home to your parents. We'll find somewhere else for you. I'll work on it. You don't need to be here if you don't want to be here. That's what I said to him. You know, at the end of the week, I met with Quran again, and he decided to stay. And today, he's a mission-minded man serving in France, helping there as an active part of the church, he and his wife. We've talked about meeting even in the last few months. This is many years ago that he was here. 
and his parents have left the church. What I want to say to you is if your aim is to elevate the standard, be sure you do it the right way. If you're going to elevate the standard, be sure you go about it the right way. It's education is the way to elevate the standard, not pressure. Pressure doesn't make any long-term elevation. It's education that makes a long-term elevation. Well, I'm almost done, and you're already ready for me to be done. But I want to read to you from Deuteronomy 6. It's one of my very favorite passages. In fact, I am suspicious. That's the wrong word. I suppose. That makes much more sense. I suppose that if Deuteronomy had a shorter name, it would be one of the most popular books in the Bible. Do you know that when Jesus was answering the, the temptations of Satan there after 40 days of, of fasting, that every one of his answers come from Deuteronomy? They all do. That's just for you to consider as you're going forward. This is Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. It says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you today will be or should be in your heart. And you will teach them diligently to your children. And you will talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk in the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you'll bind them as a sign upon your hand and they will be like frontlets between your eyes. This is the passage that is the basis of what Revelation says about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. It's about the law of God being written in the heart. That's where it belongs. The law of God belongs there. It, that's the idea. It means that your heart is really in it. But did you hear how it gets into the hearts of your children? It's by education. So this is my last point for today, and I'm just going to say it plainly. I hope that of the eight of you, that a good, goodly number of you will go into that business of true education. I hope a goodly number of you will go forward. I hope more than would even imagine to do it would help start primary schools that follow God's counsel. Because frankly, we don't have enough of them anywhere on the planet. And in Malaysia, I've found that our primary school is more effective at soul winning than any other type of ministry I've seen in the entire country. I mean, in 18 months, nine converts, it compares much better than any health program, any canvassing, any preaching, any prophecy series. Nothing that's been done there has been so effective as a primary school. But if not primary, then secondary. If not secondary, then tertiary. I mean, I hope you'll plug yourself in somewhere. Maybe not all of you. I don't know what God has in mind, but I want you to realize this, that if your aim is to elevate the standard, the, that's God's aim too. And the plan God has for elevating the standard is, in fact, education. The reason that he's given us as a church so much counsel about how our school should operate is because that's his plan for elevating the standard. Uh, like I think I've heard in some of your testimonies or testimonies about you yesterday afternoon, I think some of you, your own standards have been elevated here. I think some of you, your own values have taken, have taken an uptick while you've been here, and that is God's plan. So if it's your aim to elevate the standard, then find a way to plug yourself in to the system that God designed for elevating the standard. So what have I said today? Some simple things. I've said, I hope that you're going to use foresight. Look ahead and think. I hope you're going to avoid some dishonorable traps that catch so many, like an unbelieving spouse. And by that, I include a spouse that is a believer but not a Seventh-day Adventist. Like getting into the military or to the police force or something similar. Like working on Sabbath, heedless of the fourth commandment. 
I hope you'll avoid those common traps that seem to, however rusty they might be, they seem to catch many. And then I hope that you will think about Deuteronomy, that you'll think about Quran, and you'll realize that the standard can be elevated, but it doesn't come by just telling people what to do. It doesn't come by making regulations for them. Well, maybe it does to some degree in education, especially in the primary level, you need some regulations, don't you? But ultimately, the standard is elevated when it's done the right way. When people have education and freedom, and when education and freedom come together, then you have permanent growth. That's what you're aiming for. That's what God is aiming for. And when your aim and motto are his, and they are, I think you can be sure that God will work with you and that you'll reach your aim and have a worthy motto. Amen. As you probably know, we have chosen for our aim, sorry, our motto, to be death before dishonor. And I don't think I've met anyone that actually likes to talk about death. I mean, we can joke about it a lot, but in reality, I don't think I know anybody that likes to consider that. Because we've always been told we should live life to the fullest, and while it is true that what we do in life, it matters, it really does, but I think rarely do we realize how much the end of life matters as well. And it's almost like as if in discussing how our lives would end, we can bring its end faster. And so we don't like to talk about it. Or, or perhaps we know that if our lives were to conclude at this moment, it would not be the end that we would want it to be. See, while the inner workings of our lives really do matter, it is rarely impressed on us that the ending very much categorize the life as a whole to a greater degree than any other event within our life. Because we might have the greatest light that anyone has ever had. We may have the highest education or succeed in the greatest achievements or build a great name, but that doesn't matter if we don't consider how our lives are going to end. Because nothing, nothing we do in life will make up for the end of life. Our class has chosen death before dishonor as our motto because in that one phrase is encapsulated the idea that we believe in a cause higher than life itself that extends past the life we have here, and that our lives are not the whole, but instead they are a small part of eternity. We choose that even if it means we must cut short the brittle thread of life that holds possibilities of what the world will call greatness, we will choose to be true to God. We choose to let go of our lives here on earth so that we may have a life in eternity. By claiming death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law, we choose to live as though we die, living with the end in sight, for we know that there is a crown waiting for us in heaven, should we be faithful to God. In making this our motto, we choose poverty, reproach, even separation from friends or any other suffering, rather than to defile ourselves with sin that will separate us from God. And so in the face of the world, we will be separate, we will be distinct, apart from the world in dress, talk, and action, but thankfully we do not go in our own strength. We claim the promise given to us in Joshua 23 verse 10, which says that one man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights with you, 
Because if God is with us, who can be against us? And so we reject the world, and we accept Christ. We would rather die than give up Christ on our side. And so this is our prayer, and this is our motto. Death before dishonor, or the transgression of God's law. To elevate the standard higher than it is in present times. This statement best encapsulates the theme for the year for us, but why? Why should we care to raise the bar? Why should we attempt to surpass the example of those that have already done so well and gone before us? After all, the example that they left behind was rather a good one. So no one would blame us if we only settled for that. Why try harder? One of the most changing statements I ever heard was the following said by Mr. Neal. I used to love it when he said this and at the same time hate it. Good is the enemy of the best. And to be honest, there's a lot of good things that we have in life. But many times if we think about everything good that there is in our lives and we really examine how many times that good has gotten in the way of getting something even better, we would find that there's so many opportunities we pass by. And if we're thinking about just strictly a secular form of view, then that wouldn't matter because you could still get by. But when you are a Christian, when you're a follower of God, a true follower of God, settling is not really an option. There's no gray area with God. It's just black and white, right or wrong. Each of us as students have been exposed to no light here throughout our time at OH. And our past good is now faced with our new best. And what will all response be to that? We can choose to be mere followers of good, or we can choose to press higher. It is not that those before us have somehow failed, but it is rather a matter that our Christian lives should always be ones of improvement. I used to love this one statement that my parents used to tell me, and it is that as long as you are alive, as long as you are a breathing human being, there is always, always, room for improvement. The moment you stop trying to press forward and improve, then you begin to die completely. And this thought combined with the notion that we are not alone in our walk and that the people around us are looking at the example that we give, then raising the standard only makes more sense because perhaps your lowering of it or your settling might cause somebody else who could have pressed higher, who could have been of more use to the work of the Lord may be impeded just by your actions. This thought was perhaps the most daunting to me specifically because yes, I do want to do the right thing and my spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And how do I overcome? Because I want to do the right thing, not only for my own sake and for the sake of the Lord, but also for the sake of the people around me. So my prayer to the Lord came one morning during my devotions when I read the phrase in Messages to Young People, death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. But doesn't this sound a bit extreme, though? <laughs> I mean, yeah, and rightfully so, honestly. In the run of eternal life, good is just not enough. See, our choices, our choice is always death, no matter what. But we either choose death to this world, death to our desires, 
death to the past conformity, and in return, in the long run, really long, you get everlasting life. Or you conform to these world standards, and you have everlasting death. It's one of two choices. To think that we have a choice to keep living the way that we have been before our exposure to the lie, to the light that we have now, would be the biggest snare in the world and the biggest lie to ourselves. We are called to press higher, and if faced with the choice of whether to conform to this world or choose to be outcast and even give up our lives, the choice should be death to the world and everlasting life with the Father. And thus, we should have chosen this to be the theme for our year. And my hope is that it may keep on being the theme, not only for us seniors, but also for all of you guys that are present. Choose poverty, reproach, separation from friends, or any other suffering, rather than to defile the soul with sin. Death before dishonor or that transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. As a people professing to be reformers, treasuring the most solemn truths, purifying truths of God's word, we must elevate the standard higher than it is at its present time. As you guys have been hearing pretty much the whole weekend, the aim that our senior class decide on as we graduate is to erect the standard far higher than it is at the present time. And you know, often it is so easy to just get comfortable with our lives. You know, we just, when everything is easy, yet we have been called to look above that and to not su succumb to the comforts of life. We have been called to erect the standard, the cross of Calvary, higher than it is. And what does this entail? And I believe that this has to do with more than just a spiritual sense. I believe it has to do with every part of our life. My class has been called to do our best in all areas of life. As we depart from Awashita Hills, we will depart claiming the, pro claiming the promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This encompasses the physical, the mental, and most importantly, the spiritual faculties in life. I hope that my whole class has learned by now that nothing substantial is achievable without the power of God working in us and through us. Some of us may study to become doctors, nurses, pharmacists, engineers, and so on. Many of us will strive for intellectual greatness in this world, and there is nothing wrong with that. We, through Christ's strength, may have the potential to reach the crown of intellectual greatness in this world, and that is good. We are called to aim high. The one thing that I pray that my fellow class and I will keep before us is that instead of letting ourselves step in and take the glory for our achievements, we may always give the glory to God, for He is the rightful owner. And that we may use the talents that He is, has endowed in us for His glory, and He will use them for as long as we live. It is so easy for us as humans to step in and take all the credit like we did anything. Yet we must realize that we are but tools used for the furtherance of the gospel, and that should be our aim in life. We must ever keep before us the cross of Calvary that in this life all of our co-workers, employers, business associates, colleagues, and families can see that we are truly lifting the standard of Christ forefront in our lives. The fact of the matter is that right now the standard is not being held at full mask. And it is our job as young people to take that standard and proclaim it high so that and proclaim it high so that all can see, not us, but the beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
and friends, that is what me and my senior class have chosen to, de to dedicate our lives to. And I challenge everybody in this room to do the same thing and join us in the challenge of erecting the standard of Christ higher than it is at the present time and to its full capacity. For if that were to happen, how soon do you think Christ could come? All right, well, good morning, everybody. So each one of us every year as our graduating class, we always like to, because all of our success is not just us, but also to the people who raised us. And each one of us want to talk a little bit about our parents, and today I want to talk about my parents and how far they've gotten me. And well, I want to start off with my mom first. Well, there is, there's a lot I can say about my mom. <laughs> well, for one, she's one of the toughest people I know. Not that, not in the manner, in the fact that she can take a hit. She can, but <laughs> in the sense that she can push through any situation. And I really admire that of her. She doesn't give up. She has this stubbornness to her. She sticks to her guns, knowing that she may not look, seem good in the eyes of other people. This is one of the things I've learned. I try not to be too stubborn, but if one way it doesn't work for my mom, she always has another. She has the backup to the backup to the backup to the backup. <laughs> to the backup. But also one thing that I've learned from my mom was to trust more in God. Especially when I was coming to school here, uh, my first year, actually we were struggling to keep me here because this is, well, it's not necessarily super expensive, but you know, it's not the cheapest place. And then my mom's like, oh, your sister's coming here too. And then I was like, well, I guess I won't finish this school year. And I honestly had it in mind, well, I'll, I'm going to be here a month or two and then I'm done. But somehow, somehow, I stayed here for four years, and my sister was able to come here at the same time. My mom had faith that God was going to provide, and she always did. And my mom doesn't take a hesitate. She doesn't hesitate to take a step forward. <laughs> she's not one to take little steps. She, she tries to see, let me see how far I can jump. Like with, and she, she doesn't take a step of faith, she takes a leap of faith, a really big leap. And time and time again, I've seen how God's works. I am a living example of your faith. <laughs> well, so, and it is not like only that she allowed me to go to school here, she's like, take every class you can take, take violin, orchestra, piano, it's like, it's not that much. It's only like $500 extra at the end of the year. <laughs> but my mom was faithful. And that's why I love my mom. You pushed me to my limits and made me help me surpass my limits and help me grow in ways I didn't expect. I am who I am because I had you as my mom. I couldn't have asked for a better mom. I love you. Thank you for everything. Okay. Well, now I want to speak about my dad. But um, I'm going to speak in Spanish, and I'll give you a brief overview afterwards. Papi? Sabes, en mi vida nunca supe qué quería hacer, pero siempre, yo siempre quería ser como mi papá. Nunca sabía decir en qué estudio, qué iba a estudiar, nunca sabía, hasta ahorita no estoy muy seguro, pero siempre sabía, cuando yo crezca yo quiero ser como mi papá. Un hombre honorable. Trabaja duro y provee por su familia. 
y papi, tú tenías tanta paciencia conmigo. Yo me recuerdo cuando, oh, pues ya de más grandecito, cuando me, me fui a trabajar contigo, siempre andaba sentado por ahí, por ahí, y al fin del día andaba bien sucio, nomás porque estaba sentado, de tonta grasa en los carros. Y trabajabas conmigo como quiera. Y todo lo que sé prácticamente, hasta en, especialmente de mecánica, lo sé por qué porque tú me enseñaste y tú tuviste la paciencia conmigo y tú siempre encontrabas manera de decirme las cosas en una manera que no me dolía, pero agarraste el punto y yo agarré un punto. Y también te admiro mucho que tú sabes cuándo jugar y cuándo ser serio. Yo um, ando aprendiendo, pero pero eso con las, con las personas que ellos tienen eso, que pueden hacer eso, a ellos los admiro mucho porque me recuerdan de mi papá. Ahora nunca me siento cuando trabajo. Me preparaste para la vida práctica y siempre estuviste conmigo. Siempre me preguntabas lo que yo quería. Nunca te pusiste en frente, eh, adelante de mí. Nunca, nunca te enojaste cuando nos comimos todos los chips. <risa> y hacías lo que podías. Aunque no necesariamente era lo más lo mejor para ti, pero no más para ser tus, para hacerme feliz. Nunca, nunca, nunca ni, ni de jugando decías, ¿sería bien si hacíamos esto mejor? Siempre, si queríamos ir al parque y no querías ir, no decías y nomás nos llevabas. Y siempre nos dejaste a escoger nosotros, nunca nos forzaste a hacer nada. Y me dejaste hacer decisiones para ayudarme a aprender. Y estoy feliz que Dios me dio a ti como mi papá. Sorry. Y yo que perdón por no ser mejor hijo, pero ahora ya sé con por dar mi vida al Señor. Te quiero decir, I want to make you proud of me. But not because, pero no por yo, pero porque Dios está en mi vida. Nunca dejaste tu fe en mí. Te quiero mucho, pa. Oh, boy. Well, basically... I gave all the good attributes about my dad. <laughs> But, and, and said a few things that, you know, even in the little things, he's very, very patient with me. And I haven't been the best son to him. But, he was always there for me. Even though I wasn't always there for him. And I love my dad. Hi, Mom. Mom, where do I begin? Let me just say this first. You're honestly one of the hardest workers that I've ever seen. Ever since I can remember from when I was very small, you have always been working unselfishly for the family, trying to take care of each of us children. Some of the things that have stuck out to me the most is your absolute kindness and your utter generosity. You are so giving and so caring. And you care about people, and not just, not just your kids, but your other people a lot too. And that really speaks to me. Thank you 
or especially during my early years, helping give me a very stable and godly and spiritual environment that helped me to grow into the person I am today. I want to thank you for giving me those cooking lessons when I was eight or nine, teaching me how to make biscuits and gravy and scrambled tofu and homemade tortillas and all those things. That will come in handy when I'm alone in college. I'll miss you. Probably have to call you and ask you for the recipe again, but thank you. And yeah, you taught me how to get my way around the kitchen because you're very good at it. You've wowed every single student and staff with your cakes. You're amazing. And I remember you trying to teach me how to sew. That didn't go quite as well. Um, but mom, you are a woman of many trades, and, I, and it has been absolutely wonderful for, you to, for me to have you as a teacher all these years. I want to thank you so much for all the time you spent with me. Honestly, you were one of the main reasons that I was able to survive my time at OHA. You came as often as you could, bringing me food to eat in the car and getting me things I needed. <laughs> These last two years, I loved Wednesdays because I had a good idea that you'd be coming to prayer meeting, and that made me happy. You have also, you have often listened to my frustrated rants about certain things, and you always love to listen to me. Honestly, it's such a comfort. I know that you really do care for me, and you prove it every single day. I know that I am blessed to have an amazing woman like you as my mom. Another thing that I really appreciate is your persistence, well, both you and Dad's persistence in my music endeavors when I was very young. I know both you and Dad drove me to my lessons every week and encouraged me to practice even though I hated it so much. I can never thank you enough for not heeding my cries and letting me quit music. I remember you told me that one day I would grow up and thank you for your persistence, and I was like, that will never happen. <laughs> like, once I'm on my own, I'm going to quit. But how wrong I was. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever thank you enough for pressuring me to continue the talents that God had endowed in me. I just want to thank you so much for the care you have for me, and I love you so much, Mom. Hi, Daddy. <laughs> Dad, I never thought this day would come, but now I stand before you, the young man that you have raised, disciplined, and inspired. Dad, I want to thank you for being the best father for me that I could ever ask for. Up until this point in my life, the way that you have fathered has taught me how to love how to work hard, and how to be a good husband and father. I remember times when I was small, and Ali and I were very young, and you were very busy trying to provide for our family. And I know that you were often busy and stressed and worried, you know, and, but you would try to always give us kids a happy childhood. You would spend so much time as you could with us outside. I remember you taught me how to shoot a BB gun, you also built us a tree house. You would go fishing with me. And I also remember one day when Natalie and I ran up to you. I don't know if you remember this, but Natalie and I ran up to you, begging you to come with us and bring a pickaxe to a place near our house where we thought there was a cave behind a rock where a bear was stuck inside. <laughs> you didn't laugh at us, but you grabbed the pickaxe and gave it a few swings to suffice our curiosity. Those memories, those memories from my early years are truly special. Now, during more recent years, you have been nothing but support and encouragement. You have, been, you have encouraged me to keep going when things are tough. You have helped me to instill in me diligence and good work ethic. Thank you for taking me to work those times that you do. I know I'm not good or quick with IT, but you have been very patient with me as I've been learning. Your kindness and fatherliness have really made me admire and love you, Dad. And just like... Mom, I cannot thank you enough for your persistence in my music, despite all my cries. You knew what you were doing, and because of that, I would not trade my love for music for anything in the world. And I know that means a lot, because you also love music a lot. And as I go on, on with life, I know that both you and Mom 
will be there for me because you have both always been there for me in the past. Thank you so much for you being the best dad that I could ever ask for. Dear mom, thank you for being my mom. Thank you for your bravery in bringing a tag along into the family. And I thank you for training me in an amazing way while I was growing up. Thank you for almost breaking your thumb while mashing up my favorite childhood food, which was a whole bunch of mashed bananas and peanut butter, believe it or not. And thank you for taking away the things that would hurt me and giving me the things that would help me. Thank you so much for taking the time to counsel me through the small childhood difficulties that, in your eyes and in the way you responded, was no small deal. Thank you for all the long talks. Thank you for all the short talks. I'm sorry for all the times you wanted to talk to me and I was not interested. And I thank you for always being interested in what I had to say, even if it had nothing to do whatsoever with practical life. In every phase of my interests, you would invest time and money to help me through it, no matter how tight we were. In many young persons' vocabulary, the way in which they describe their mothers goes as follows. Your mother let you do that? Wow, your mother's pretty cool. It is from you, Mom, that I owe my education on the concept of risk. You taught me through example the correct way to approach risk. You never let me do things that would unnecessarily put me at risk. In other words, you saved my skin multiple times so that I could spin that skin towards things that could benefit myself or others. You taught me above all to risk all for God. The attitude that you set for the home was one of freedom. It is best summed up by another famous mother, which I compare to you and you many times over did just as well. It was the mother of the Wright brothers, and her words were often, often repeated by you when I would come to you with an idea or a question. Perhaps you can try. All that I ever was and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe it to you, Mom. I love you, and thank you for being my mom. Dear Dad, Thank you for being my best friend. I'm gonna share an experience that strangely defines your personality and my relationship with you. I was, believe it or not, around three years old. You know those few memories that just stick, and nothing else sticks, but those few memories that stick? Well, this is one of them. I was playing on the carpet with a toy airplane. Um, I was pushing you around on the floor, and I remember my dad's voice looking down at me and saying, Kevin, why are you pushing that on the floor? It's an airplane, it's supposed to be flying. It's three years old. And that just, that really was one of the most profound moments of my life, you know? <laughs> and uh, that strangely defines your relationship with me. The 15 years ensuing have been filled with many such enlightenments. Dad, what do you think of this? No, Kevin, I really don't think that's gonna work. Hey, Dad, what do you think about that? Well, maybe some potential, or my favorite, I don't know, Kevin. <laughs> You're just going to have to try and find out. That was one of my favorite ones. Well, actually, I hated it the most. Uh, thank you so much for allotting a certain amount of time each day to spend with me, no matter how busy you were as a child. Playing baseball with me, even if I was the only one ever batting for reasons not discussed here. My dad is a very humble person, and he's quiet here at Washita or in public. Here are a few things he may have never told you. First of all, my father is the first in his family line to pursue aviation, holding a professional pilot's license with endorsements for complex aircraft and multi-engine aircraft with more than 1,500 hours of flying experience. I didn't ask him first, I hope that's correct. Um, that's how I used to win bread, if you can call that a job, which you can. His countless stories of flying, such as flying through a circular rainbow or getting sucked up into a thunderstorm, are the reason that my brother, current pilot, and myself fell in love with aviation. 
My dad has a degree in physics and he wanted to do research, which is just a fancy term professionals use for playing around in a laboratory. However, he decided to teach all of us instead of have fun in the laboratory, but he still likes to do that. Thank you, Dad, for being an amazing, hardworking, very hardworking, dedicated, studious, fun, loving, quiet, and there's no reason to talk, father and best friend. I love you, Dad. When I was writing all this, I wrote it, and I was like, I'm not crying. <laughs> and then I started reading it, and then it started coming, so I decided not to read it. But now I will try. <laughs> Dear Mom, there are a lot of things I could thank you for but I have to pick a few. And one of those things is that you, you taught me how to think. And it might sound strange, but I, I do believe that it's very difficult to teach someone how to think in this day and age. Well, as Kevin was saying about one of those memories, I have one of those strangely, oddly sticking out memories. And it goes something like this. Well, we, at some point, I don't remember how old I was, I had a talk with my mom, and she explained to me that sometimes there were things that she would have to tell us, and we'd just have to believe them. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so you can make anything? Well, not really. But anyway. Um, but so there were, she basically explained that Everything was categorized in these two things. She would tell us something, and either she could explain it, or sometimes we just have to believe it, or just do it. And I remember soon after you had that conversation, um, you asked me to do something, and I, I distinctly remember asking you, is this one of those things you can explain, or is this one of the things I just have to do? And I don't remember which one it was, but... I think that mentality really taught me that it really taught me to think for myself, but it also taught me to realize the place that authority had in my life. And I think that's very important because indirectly that taught me the place that God had in my life. Because though God could explain everything, He doesn't always. I also want to thank you for that time where I suddenly became really, really moody and sad. <laughs> I don't remember when it started, but I... I guess it was sort of like, you know, kid becoming teenager sort of thing. I guess that was part of it, but at the same time, I'm sorry I never felt like I could explain. And I'm sorry that I never felt like I could explain how I felt. It's, it's not that you did anything wrong. I, I know you didn't. And I'm sorry for every time I took out my emotions on you. It really wasn't fair. <laughs> and I know that now. Thank you for being willing to 
homeschool me through pretty much all of school up to me coming here. And now that I look back on it, choosing to homeschool me was so much crazier than I thought it was at the time. Because it's not like you've ever had any experience teaching before. And on top of that, English wasn't your first language. Yet even through that, you somehow put us through a high, extremely ridiculously high levels of vocabulary such that I didn't have to study that hard for vocab tests. I, I guess I didn't get to appreciate that until now. I remember there were several times, I'm pretty sure you were questioning why you even wanted to homeschool us. But I know the only reason you did it was because you knew that that was the right thing to do. So thank you for pushing through that and pointing me in the right direction. And I think you did a pretty good job, um, if, if I could say so myself, considering, I mean, considering I didn't turn into a stereotypical antisocial homeschooler, even though my friends could argue that I am. I really love you, Mom, and I don't always know how to say it or show it. So at least I can thank you now. As I look back, sometimes, well, not sometimes, like very often, I think it is quite unfair that I had such great parents because I know many people don't. So thank you for that. I love you, Mom. Dear Dad, again, I have many things I can thank you for, but again, I have to just pick only a few. Thanks for being a kid with me and for being willing to put up all, with all these crazy ideas that I've had over the years. I guess I should have outgrown crazy ideas, but I really don't think I have. <laughs> I remember when we were little, you used to wrestle with us, and then you'd let us win, and it never occurred to me that you were doing that on purpose. <laughs> it's pretty silly, but I guess I actually thought I was stronger than you at the time. So thank you for not forcing me to grow up. Because you let me grow up at my own pace. And I think that saved me from a lot of, I guess, quote unquote, childhood trauma that I could have had. But at the same time, I, unfortunately, I think that means that all the childhood trauma I had was because I caused it on myself. Also, unfortunately, I still want to be a kid, but I know that's not possible. <laughs> but at least I'll always still be your kid. Thanks for dealing with all the stuff in life that I don't know how to deal with, so I don't have to do them like taxes. <laughs> I think too many times I oversimplified your job and I thought that you disappeared for a while and you came back with money, because that was the only thing I knew back then. You made it seem really easy, but I'm starting to get a better picture of how life isn't that simple. Thank you for keeping your voice soft when I would get all emotional. And I'm sorry that I haven't really mastered doing the same. I think at one point I was able, but I got caught up with the world's idea that men were supposed to be strong, that you, and if, that if you didn't have any punch, you wouldn't be listened to. I 
I have a distinct memory that has always stuck with me of you. I remember one time back in our second house, I believe, in Escondido. I would, I remember I walked outside of my room and I saw you doing your devotionals and I, I don't know why that stuck with me so much but that was really encouraging for me. You've really been a good example for me. And I know that neither you nor mom are perfect, but I know that you did your best, and that's really all I can ask for. And I know that that is all God looks on. So thank you for everything. It's kind of hot up over here. Uh, can somebody bring some Kleenex? Because I think I might be sweating through my eyes um, pretty soon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I was told to do half a page, but I guess we went over. <laughs> Mom, if there was one person who pushed me uh, to my maximum capacity my entire life, it has to be you. You always pushed me back up after every fall, made me believe that I could touch the stars if I put my mind to it. Everything I have done in my entire life, you have been, you have been my number one supporter except when it comes to soccer. <laughs> you, you often leave my soccer games. <laughs> um, or cleaning, yeah, you don't, you don't like my cleaning either. <laughs> uh, I can say today, Mom, that I, could have, I couldn't have made it this far without you. I, without both you and Dad guiding me, through every step of, of, of my life, I wouldn't, have, uh, I wouldn't be here in Christ's path or even in church. Uh, I could be anywhere, honestly. But if it wasn't for you, I, w I, w I wouldn't be here. You, uh, you both, Dad and, and, uh, Dad and, and you, uh, have taught me that family comes first. And... Since they're very little, I've taken it very serious. You named me Alex because my name stands for protector, protector of my sisters. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for believing in me and always going, always giving me the support I need to, to push forward, even when I'm not, I, I'm not the best son. Yeah you know, exists, <laughs> but I try to be. And Dad, uh, there's a lot of things I could say about you. Uh, since very little, you always ask me one thing, if you were my best friend. And I could I could never answer that because I always thought I had another best friend. <laughs> but now that I'm older, I can say that you have been my best friend since the very beginning. I always thought that we were far away, but it turns out we were closer than I thought. You have been there and given sacrifices from the very beginning, even before I was born. You made the sacrifice to Kate as an immigrant to a different country to give me the opportunities that I could not have in Mexico. You gave up your goals, your dreams, your home, your family to give me opportunities here 
for a better life, for a better future. You asked nothing in exchange for, for me, but you used every opportunity to, to make me become something greater. You told me that I could become greater than you, but in my entire life, I always looked up to you. Every, t every time in public school, at the very beginning, the first day of school, they asked us who was our superhero. And I always, every year after year, I always said it was you. And it was always for the wrong reasons. I always said it was because it was of your, of your soccer skills. I always wanted to be like you. I looked at your trophies and I said, I want to be great like my dad. But uh, at this age, you had already won more than I already have. <laughs> um, You, you helped me become the, uh, a, a Christian. You became a Christian so that I could do things the right way, so that I could have even a greater opportunity than, than the very first you gave me coming here to the United States. An opportunity for, for eternal life. You said that it doesn't matter what I became, that you would be behind me at every step of the way, that as long as I had Christ, in my life, that I would be something in life, that it, I could have all the money in the world, but if I didn't have Christ, I would be nothing. Every morning I wake up, or every morning I know that you have your devotions. It pushes me to become a better person, a better Christian, become closer to God. And as an example of a father, how you are with, with my siblings and how you were with me. The long walks that we would do when we were alone, the talks that we had, or the drives that we would do from soccer game to soccer game. Those were our times to talk. And you always told me to strive to be better, that the only reason you were here in a foreign country was for me, so that I could be somebody in life. But to always put God, God first. And now I can say that graduating, I didn't do it myself. I did it with you all as a family. And being the first to graduate in our family, I didn't do this alone. I did it with you all behind me. So thank you for the examples you've set, both you and mom. And thank you for being uh, so close to God to help me follow your path to follow Christ. Thank you. I'm not gonna use the projectors. I don't know why they went down. Um, but, uh, all right. Do I, uh, is Miss Minju here? Do you think you can translate for me? All right, dear mom, I've really bugged you every time we went to the store, haven't I? 제가 우리가 가게 슈퍼마켓 같은 데갈 때마다 엄마 좀 귀찮게 했죠. I wanted this. I wanted that. I wanted everything in the store. 가게 있는 거 이것도 원하고 저것도 달라 그러고 그랬어요. When we went grocery shopping, you would try to put the items in the cart, but then I would manage to just sneak in five more. Uh, I don't know how you kept up with me for all these years. I know you cared about me, and you did your best to help me. 저를 항상 어, 그, 저에게 관심 가져주시고 예, 이제까지 도와주신 거 알고 있습니다. You would give life, you would give to my life color and made sure that I was always happy. Uh, I cherish those experiences. Uh, 생각합니다. Now, if only I could get better at speaking Korean, then I would communicate better with you. 제가 이제 한국말만 좀더 배우면 엄마랑 잘 소통할 수 있을 것 같아요. I'll try my best to learn it soon. 그래서 제가 이제 곧 열심히 공부하려고 합니다. 
Mom, I thank you for your love and your care. 엄마 항상 사랑해 주시고 항상 저를 도와주셔서 감사합니다. Thank you for your support and constantly working late hours just to help me. 항상 저를 이렇게 돌봐주시고 저를 위해 항상 늦게까지 일해주신 것도 감사합니다. And I remember, Mom, that you would always ask me, "Did you eat?" 항상 저에게 엄마가 물어보셨어요. 밥 먹었니? Well, in the Korean culture, the mother always asks, "Did you eat?" Even if you already had like a meal. 한국 문화에 따르면 밥을 먹었음에도 불구하고 항상 밥 먹었냐고 물어보죠. So yes, Mom, the school didn't leave me to starve. 음, 네, 엄마, 학교에서 저를 굶기지 않았습니다. <웃음> With much love, your son Moses. 네, 항상 이렇게 사랑하는 아들로 이렇게 예, 도와줬어요. Dear Dad. 아버님. It's been a while since we've last met. 한번 뵌지가 좀 됐습니다, 아버님. So much has happened, and I did miss you. 아 그동안 많은 일이 있었는데 아버님을 보고 싶었어요. I've learned and grown in this place and understood more about what it means to put away childish things. I remember that when we first came here, I had no idea where we were going. 제가 여기 처음에 왔을 때는 제가 도대체 무엇을 해야 되는지 잘 알지 못했습니다. You told me there was a school that was uh, uplifting the standards of God, and I wasn't sure what that meant. 여기 가면 이렇게 하나님의 그런 이제 그런 법을 잘 따라서 한 학교가 있는데 이제 그런 곳에 가는 것이 도대체 뭐, 무슨 뜻을 의미하는지 잘 몰랐습니다. You always taught me that religion was something that we had to be serious about, not to just take lightly. 어, 항상 저에게 이렇게 종교는 항상 이렇게 심, 어, 이제 신중하게 생각해야 되는 것이고 단, 간단하게 이렇게, 이렇게 대하, 생각할 문제가 아니라고 얘기해 주셨습니다. I thank you for showing me what it means to serve God. 그래서 하나님을 어떻게 이렇게 섬겨야 하는지 가르쳐 주신 것에 대해서 감사합니다. I want to thank you for all the times you always try to teach me practical things around the house. 어, 집안에서도 그러니까 실제적으로 이렇게 배울 수 있는 것들을 이렇게 가르쳐 주신 것을 인하여 감사드립니다. Sometimes you would let me do things and I would break them. 항상 어떤 때는 저에게 뭔가 시켜 주셨는데 제가 이렇게 무언가를 이렇게 망가뜨리고 했습니다. But you were still patient with me. You know, you might have yelled at me a few times, but I did my best. 어, 그래서 저에게 제가 뭔가 망가뜨렸을 때 저에게 큰 소리도 내기도 했는데 그래도 이렇게 잘 참아 주셔서 저를 잘 참아 주셔서 감사합니다. I remember that while I was growing up, we were on the farm. 어, 저희가 어렸을 때 이렇게 농장에서 자란 걸 기억합니다. You always taught me that farming has many techniques and many root. How do you say? There's many things you have to do in order to get a garden going. 어, 농장에서 쓰면 기술도 많이 필요하고. 이런 이제 작물을 잘 키우기 위해서 그런 지혜도 많이 필요하다고 어, 가르쳐 주셨습니다. I was so surprised on how much things you knew, and I was like, this this guy is the best farmer around here. 어, 아버님이 항상 얼마나 많은 것들을 알고 있는지에 대해서 항상 놀랐고, 어, 에, 아버지가 최고의 농부가 아닌가라고 생각을 했었습니다. <웃음> and so, I'm pretty sure that you still want to do farming, but uh, you know the times have changed. But uh, you know, it's exciting to see that maybe someday I could help you out on the farm again. 어, 아버님이 어, 계속 그렇게 농사를 짓고 싶었던 걸 알고 언젠가는 저도 어, 그렇게 도움을 같이 농사일을 도와드릴 수 있지 않을까 생각합니다. I still remember many of the lessons you've taught me, and ha it has given me the ability to know what to do and to have the common sense that many youth lack today. 어, 이제까지 저에게 가르쳐 주신 것들 많이 기억하고 있고요. 그리고 이제 이렇게 살아가는데 그런 이렇게 마음이 나는 도움이 될 거라고 생각합니다. And also you would strive to make sure that I had the best education. 그리고 항상 제가 최고의 그런 교육을 받을 수 있게 노력해 주셔서 감사합니다. I remember before I went to third grade, you bought a math book from one of the it was Barnes and Noble or something, Books a Million, some of those. Bookstores, and you went straight to the math section. 
어, 제가 3학년쯤 되었을 때인가요? 저에게 그런 수학 책을 사기 위해서 그런 이제 북스토어에 가서 이렇게 책을 곧, 어, 가게에 들어가서 곧바로 그 수학 책 파는 곳으로 이렇게 걸어 가셨던 게 기억합니다. I saw the book that you pulled out from the shelf and it was this thick. 어, 책에, 책을 이렇게 꺼내셨는데 책이 이만큼 두꺼웠어요. And you told me finish it before you get to third grade. 어, 이 책, 이거, 이 학년 끝나기 전에 이책다 공부해. Um, well, I failed that, obviously. And then you wanted to know what I was wanting to do when I grew up. I think what you didn't want to hear was everything except being a doctor. In fact, you wanted all three, my sisters and I, all to be doctors. 어, 제 누나와 저 모두가 의사가 되길 원하셨습니다. But uh, I didn't want to be a doctor. <웃음> 근데 저는 의사가 되고 싶어 하지 않았어요. I told you I wanted to be a scientist. 제가 과학자가 되고 싶다고 얘기했었습니다. Well, guess what? I'm going to be a computer scientist. <웃음> 에이, 제가 이제 그 컴퓨터 과학 컴퓨터 과학 기술자가 되려고 합니다. Dad, I want to thank you for taking care of me. 어, 저를 이제까지 항상 돌봐주신 거에 인해 감사드립니다. Thank you for your time. 저에게 항상 시간 내주셔서 감사합니다. And thank you for giving me the best of the best. 그리고 저에게 항상 최고의 것을 주신 것을 인해서 감사드립니다. With much love, your son, Moses. 사랑합니다. Yeah. Okay. 사랑합니다. Papi, cuando pienso en una de las memorias más ah, tempranas de mi niñez, siempre recuerdo nuestros momentos juntos. Ah, recuerdo especialmente cuando jugábamos al sumito, wrestling, y ah, tú pretendías que eras muy débil para Kevin y yo. Y siempre nos dejabas ganar. <laughs> um, y yo pensaba que era like, la mujer maravilla o algo así, porque podía ganarle a mi papá. <laughs> También recuerdo que <laughs> durante nuestros viajes largos en México, cuando todavía no teníamos los televisores chiquiticos, nos contabas <laughs> las aventuras de Garrapatín. Y <laughs> era un cuento de una garrapata aventurosa que viajaba por el mundo y tenía muchas experiencias muy interesantes como nosotros. <risa> y, um, <risa> Recuerdo también que a ti nunca te importaba si estuvieras cansado, si no te gustaba, cuando íbamos a la piscina y nos quedábamos en los hoteles. Tú odias el agua. Yo no sabía eso hasta que crecí. <risa> Pero siempre te metías a la piscina y siempre inventabas los juegos <risa> más extraños, como el tiburón cocón y a ah, Somonduco y no sé qué. <risa> Eso. <risa> siempre estuviste ahí para asegurarte de que tuviera alguien con quien jugar. Y recuerdo cuando éramos chiquitos, nos enseñaste a amar el fútbol muchísimo. Nos compraste a Kevin y a mí unas camisetas de Ronaldinho. La de, la de Kevin era de, de Barça y la mía era de Brasil. Y también nos compraste los guayos, para que tacos, para que pudiéramos ir al, al parque y siempre nos llevabas los domingos a jugar. Y llegábamos más embarrados, pero <risa> habíamos tenido... Ah, mucha diversión también cuando mamá iba al conservatorio. Nos encantaba porque tú nos cuidabas y nos llevabas y nos comprabas este maní y nos comprabas malta. Y Gatorade, eso. <ríe> de naranja. Y aunque hacía un calor del chiras, no te importaba quedarte con nosotros y jugar. O cuando íbamos a los, a, a los moles, 
no querías pagar por las máquinas de jugar, así que nos montabas y las movías y, y hacías uh, y nosotros pensábamos que pues era, era la cosa más bella del mundo. Um, quiero decirte que siempre fuiste mi héroe de pequeña, cuando pensaba en qué tipo de hombre quería cuando creciera, decía que quería que fuera como mi papá. Y recuerdo que decía que jamás me iba a ir de la casa y siempre iba a dormir en la cama contigo, aunque él se enojara. <risa> Muchas cosas han cambiado, pero uh, no me había dado cuenta esta noche cuánto todavía me amas. Por cierto tiempo, estuve enojada por lo que pasó. Porque tú me habías enseñado de la Biblia, de las experiencias con el Espíritu Santo. Y no podía creer que mi papá estaba cambiando. Y pensaba que si eso cambiaba también, iba a cambiar tu amor por mí. Que de alguna manera, si no, podía ser. Tantas cosas que habían pasado, habían cambiado y, y me preocupaba que tu amor por mí también iba a cambiar. Pero no te eché, te quedaste hasta las 3 de la mañana cosiéndome este vestido para que me quedara. Y no te importó, no te quejaste. Y no me había dado cuenta que el amor de un padre nunca cambia. No importa si se caiga al cielo, la tierra. Nunca había aprendido a apreciar tanto lo que hacías por mí. Y pensaba que de alguna manera era... No sé, era desagradecida, pero me enseñaste una lección, que no importa qué es lo que pase, amar significa sacrificarse y solo puedo orarle al Señor que lo que tú me hayas enseñado lo sigas viviendo en tu vida papi. Te quiero ver en el cielo. Te amo con todo mi corazón. I love you, Daddy. Goodness, that was supposed to be the easy one. <laughs> um, Mom, by the way, I, I said that I love my dad. <laughs> in a lot more words than that. <laughs> And uh, just as a short side note, the reason why this dress fits me this morning is because that man stayed up until three in the morning Uh, sewing it and tailoring it so that it would actually fit me. <laughs> He's really good. You guys should check him out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mom, Mom, so you have no idea how hard it was to write this, and it's not because I didn't know what to say. It's just because I didn't know what to leave out. Uh, after all, How can I do justice to the person that raised me in just one page, double-spaced, 12-point font? <sighs> I suppose I could recall all the seemingly endless hours we spent sitting in the kitchen table while you patiently helped me stumble through my reading as a seven-year-old. I remember how you used to wipe away my tears as I frustratingly said that I would never be good at school because of my dyslexia, because I was slow, because I couldn't memorize my timetables. I could spend hours recalling such memories, but I, I discovered that although memories will stay with you for a long time, it is the values behind those memories that last for eternity. In actuality, What I recall about 
the most about those times that I was extremely frustrated and crying and saying that it wasn't fair, that Kevin had straight A's and I could not get a B for the life of me. I remember he used to tell me one story, it was a poem actually. And, uh, and I thought I'd share this with people because it's the most important thing you've ever taught me, aside from my love for God. He used to tell me the story of this one little snail and this Andean condor. It's a huge bird from the uh, Andes mountain range. It has a wingspan of about 12 feet. And this thing can pick up cows if it sweeps down and, and picks them up, even cows. And so uh, it's massive. And just by opening its wings, it can take off. And once upon a time, there was such condor flying from mountain top to mountain top. But one day, he came down to the valley to check out what people were up to. And he found this little snail on a rock. And boastingly, he said, you see the top of that mountain peak. To those heights, only a condor like myself can reach. And the snail, he tried to look at the top of the mountain. He could barely make it out. And he said, my friend, we can all make it there. The condor just sneered, laughed, and uh, told him, all right, well, you try it and see. And with that, he just opened his wings and took off. After reaching the mountaintop in just a couple minutes, he looked down, and obviously the snail was nowhere to be seen, so he moved on with his life, forgetting all about the incident, and spent the rest a couple more years just flying from mountaintop to mountaintop. One day, he stopped on this peak to catch his breath, and to his surprise, there, making the final effort, was the little snail. The conjurer was furious. He's like, how dare you come to my realm, to my kingdom? These heights are owned by me. Only a person like myself with my abilities is able to be up here. And then the snail looked up and said, look at me. Look at my body. You see all those scars, slimes, bruises? Each one of those are the marks of the rocks that I had to climb over to get to where I am today. I was halfway up. I lost my consciousness. I rolled all the way back. I woke up again, and I kept climbing. And here you have me today. We can all make it to the top. To, God, to some, God gave wings, and to others, he just gave perseverance to keep moving. And I remember, Ma, <laughs> you used to say, every time after you finished that story, you were like that little snail. And that used to, piss, that used to get me so enraged. I was like, why? That's not fair. <laughs> I don't want to be the snail. I want to be like a condor, like my brother. But she told me to never give up, to keep trying. And Mom, I never knew how much that would mean to me until today. Because it turns out I wasn't the only snail. <laughs> you and I both. And even now, going back to college, man, ESL, straight A's for nursing, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but you keep moving forward. And so the reason that I'm standing here today, at the end of this mountain peak, it's because of what you taught me, to never give up. There's a reason why I argued every single point for Mr. Neal's class. 
There was a reason that I sometimes would wake up at three in the morning to finish my Bible docs homework. <laughs> if there was a reason why I told everybody that I love school and that I wanted to do my best while I was here, if there's a reason why I actually now like reading, <laughs> it's because of you. I could not have asked for a better, better mother because you taught me that that principle applies to everything in life. Even when you feel like you can't get to the mountain top of perfection in Christianity and following God, you're never alone because he's got your back. And as long as he keeps pushing you forward, you can always keep moving forward. And so as I move on to whatever may come, because I don't really know what it might be, I know that I'll always keep that in my mind. Best memory from you, best lesson you taught me. Just keep always moving forward and upward. I love you, Ma. Nada más faltan cinco días y te voy a poder ver a mi papá y a ti y a mis hermanitos. Te quiero decir, mami, que te aprecio muchísimo y que eres una mujer muy trabajadora, muy luchadora y a veces no sé cómo le haces. mamá porque sé que tú has pasado muchas cosas pero sigues ahí luchando sigues estando fuerte aprecio el sacrificio tuyo y de mi papá por haberme mandado aquí para tener un una mejor vida, por tener un mejor estudio, porque querían que yo pudiera ser alguien en la vida y quiero decirte papi que te quiero mucho y que y en tus maneras y por ser bien consentido con, conmigo, con mis hermanitos. <ríe> sé que ustedes dos cuando estaban pequeños no, ten, no tenían todo lo que haber querido tener y que ustedes lucharon y trabajaron mucho para estar donde están ahorita. Se vinieron a Estados Unidos para tener un mejor futuro y sé que ahora están en México, pero siguen trabajando por sus hijos, por querer que nosotros seamos algo. Y aprecio el sacrificio que, que ustedes han hecho y aunque no he vivido todos mis años con ustedes, igual quiero pedirle que, que me disculpe por no ser una buena hija. Quiero que me perdones, mami, porque no he sido una buena hija en el tiempo que estaba yo allá. No aproveché el tiempo. Estoy muy contenta porque ya voy a poder ir a verlos y pasar más tiempo con ustedes 
y ya podemos platicar de las cosas que tú quieres platicar, mami. Y pues nomás pasar tiempo en familia y te quiero dar gracias a mi papá igual por siempre querer que sus hijos sean mejores siempre y aunque a veces te impacientabas, pero sé que lo hacías porque tú querías que, que fuéramos lo mejor, querías que seamos el número uno. Les quiero decir que los quiero mucho y que los aprecio. También para mí. Um, ahora quiero decirle algo a mi tío Gabriel y a mi tía Carmen. Yo he estado viviendo, la primera vez que yo viví con ustedes fue cuando estaba en el cuarto grado y mis papás apenas se habían ido para México. Y aunque sí los extrañaba mucho, no me sentía sola porque ustedes me quisieron como otra hija. Y estoy tan feliz porque Dios os puso en mi vida y me haber me pudieron enseñar cosas de la Biblia, estudiar mi Biblia. Les quiero dar gracias porque, aunque estaban en otro estado trabajando bien, se vinieron a Arkansas, dejaron, mi tío dejó su trabajo, su comunidad, solo para venir por la escuela de nosotros, de Gaby y yo. Y les quiero agradecer eso. Y cuando, sé que cuando yo me fui para México por un tiempo y regresé y no era la misma y no estaba practicando lo que ustedes me habían enseñado, pero aún así ustedes me trataron bien y no, no, nunca me hicieron un lado, siempre eran pacientes conmigo. Quiero dar gracias por eso. Los quiero mucho a los cuatro. Oh man, the last one have the most pressure. <sighs> um, I wrote it in English, so, but we have translators. To the world's number one mom, and you're the best mom that a son has ever had. And I haven't much appreciate about you. Um, <laughs> you have done so many things for me through the years. Sometimes it might not seem like it, but <laughs> I really do love you. And there may be other moms, but you are the most important ones to me. <sighs> Thank you for everything you have done and when I was sick, you always stood by me. And there's days I appreciate all the things that you've done for me. Thank you. I might not always be the angel around you, but <laughs> I do appreciate you for real. And I had many questions when I was young, when I was a uh, kindergarten, you know, just question about my mom's, you know, why other other children, other kids can read comics. <laughs> I had to learning how to draw and talking with the piano, you know. 
Well, others are playing games. I had to, <laughs> I had to learn all my ABCs. And when I say I want this huge, big airplane, and all you give me is like this boring box. <laughs> so <laughs> I have questioned, are you really my mom, you know? <laughs> but I start to know that how, how much you care about me to give me those things. Um, you want the best for me. You always want me to be good. And I don't know your pain, your joys. I know you're hiding. You don't tell me a lot. But I know that when you hurt, I hurt together. And when you're happy, happy too. I wrote a little poem for you that, for mom, your heart won't let, won't let me see. But I know there's a secret recipe that is warm to me. I want to hold your hands day and night, hand to hand walking through life. Listen to you and I won't hurt your feelings. I want to grow up and protect your willings. The, your beautiful hairs will soon turn white, but by the angel, the magic of angels was warm and kind. I don't know, I can put those love in words, but in this special day, I just wanna say I love you, mom. And I wish you are always happy and well-being. And here's for my dad, my dear dad. In my memory, you are the superhero. <laughs> when I was young, you always protect me. You are the mountains that I always can lean on and to love. But sometimes the mountain might seem annoying. <laughs> uh, yeah, but now I understand that love, that mountain is always there. Don't matter what, it's just there. That you care so much about me. I remember in the sunshine, I ride on your neck, sitting. <laughs> and that time, I don't know that your happiness is my happiness. When I'm happy, you're happy. And a lot of those times when you're trying to teach me things, sometimes I got annoyed. I might slam the door on you. <laughs> Until one day I see that one time I was sick and I opened my I was on bed, I opened my tired eyes, and I saw you next to me lying down, kneeling down to God and praying. I heard some words, not really clear, but I know you are praying for my willings and health. I really appreciate it. That moment, Thank you for being my dad. I ask that for time that it may slow down. <laughs> Won't let you get older anymore. And I'll trade everything for you. But I don't know what I can pay back for your love. Please accept my insignificant care for you. Just a little thing. Thank you for all you have done. Always being there for me, giving me the best. And I know I don't say thank you a lot, but 
I do appreciate everything you do. Are you still worried about me? You still care about me. But the child that you are loved about, you care about, has grown up. And he wants to hold your hands like before. Thank you for all you do. I love your dad and I love your mom. have been waiting for. It's a little different. No hugs. 
six feet, but at least you get your diploma, so that's, it's worth it all. And we've tried to comply with the governor and the Department of Health regulations, and we're doing our best. Jose Luis Campofano. Ana Daniela Ruiz Garcia. Colton Glenn Gibson is graduating in absentia. Nathaniel Erickson James Gillis. Kevin Andrew Glass. Dylan Michael Holman. Alex Elio Mendoza. Moses Nin Park. Dileen Andrea Coutinho. Kai Yi. My dear son Dylan, now as you are stronger than me, I won't ask for rematch on wrestling anymore. <laughs> okay, as we conclude our graduation commencement today, let's have a closing prayer. Let's bow our heart. My Heavenly Father, dear God, I pray for our 2020 graduates and lift them up before you. I thank you so much for them. They are a gift to us as our parents and to many others too. I ask that you would keep their footsteps firm and remind them that you are with them always. I ask that for your wisdom and clear directions over their life which you have planned and prepared for them. Oh Lord, our world is currently anxious, fearful, and uncertain, especially with this COVID-19 pandemic. I pray for your protection, for your covering, that you would surround their life with your Holy Spirit, convict their hearts to remain faithful to you to the end. 
Our nations along the rest of the world is currently going through a difficult time dealing with this COVID-19 and many other issues too. The imposed lockdown for our, break our, our government had led us into economic recessions, many businesses closed down, millions lost their job, hundreds of thousands of people found themselves dependent on government to meet their basic needs. School, colleges cancel their classes, sending their students home before the school term end. But God, your Bible, your words encourage us to be strong and be of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. To elevate the standard is your, if their aim. I pray for our graduates that they are filled with your courage and strength, that they may be a light to their families, to their friends, and to their neighbors, even to their enemies in this uncertain time. Death before dishonor is their motto. So I ask that you will remind them every day how very much you love them, that they would find security and confidence fully in you, knowing that you are trustworthy and true. Jesus is a lamb for their feet, and a light to their path. Sign offer them, please, Lord. Fill them with your spirit. Bless them with your love and your mercy. Oh, Lord, we wanted to thank you also for the faculty and staff at Washita Hill Academy who has dedicated their life to train our children. May you bless them and keep them safe in your arms always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. seniors to stand you're here in the audience there will be our class class of 2021 we're so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy if you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did make sure you like share and subscribe also if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.